Not yet? Okay, then we'll save it for afterwards. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our next two guests, Mr. Andre Kirjan and Mr. Tomas Bondos. Gentlemen. So... <laughs> I really get to try out a lot of chairs today. <laughs> yep, please do. So Andre Kirjan is an experienced lead partner in Central Europe projects. He works at Slovenia's National Institute of Chemistry in the Department for Polymer Chemistry and Technology. And Mr. Tomas Bondos is responsible for energy management in the city of Bitgosz. Did I say that right? Oh, yes. Uh, in northern Poland, uh, and he's part of uh, Interreg Central Europe projects in that city. So, gentlemen, welcome uh, to both of you. Uh, Mr. Andrzej Kirjan, I'd like to start with you. Um, now, the two projects that you worked on were called Plastice and Biocompact CE. So I'm not going to get into it myself. Roughly speaking, it had to do with environmental issues um, affecting small and medium-sized enterprises in uh, Europe that go across uh, national borders. Maybe we can start with the Plastice project. Um, what more can you tell us about what this was all about? Okay. Oh, you need a microphone, which is right in front of you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to first thank for the opportunity to be here and be able to address you. Um, yeah, these, these project names are always very interesting. They don't say very much, so you always need an introduction. My topics always are related to plastics and environmental aspects of plastics, and we all use plastics all the time. I normally say plastics are our friends that we just dearly deny at any opportunity, but they're still our friends. We use them every day, all the time, but do we like them? No, we don't. So plastics are not that bad. We have to embrace this friend and also control it when he gets out of line. So Plastice, uh, as we used to call it, is a project that's finished, and there we were actually trying to promote the use of bioplastics in Central Europe. We are trying to establish framework conditions, so general conditions, so that more of these materials would be used. I'm coming from can, can you research. Okay, I'm coming from research. So I knew a lot of researchers in Central Europe that knew a lot about bioplastics, but nobody else knew anything about it. And then, you know, they all rushed over to new topics. So uh, we felt that we need to tell more people about this, particularly the uh, public and companies, so they would use these materials. So it was mainly about um, promotion and communication. And our approach was, or my approach as the lead partner, I always told my partners, whoever you can reach, whoever's willing to listen, hit them. NGOs, schools, companies, policy, ministries, anybody. Anybody who comes and shows a little bit of interest, catch them, tell them your story. And, and we succeeded that finally this story was starting to circulate around. It's like hitting a rock for a long time and nothing happens. And then all of a sudden it starts crumbling. And what I noticed, we could hear the words that we put out so many times coming back like an echo. People were repeating them. So we said, ah, you listened, and we did get you. And what were, they say and what were the words that they were repeating? Well, they understood what bioplastics were. They can understood how they can be sustainable, that they need to be certified, that there are many you know, technical issues that you must understand they understood what compostability was as opposed to biodegradability, home compost, industrial compost, things like that, that we were trying to explain because they're very, very crucial and important issues. Okay, so bioplastics as being more environmentally friendly. Yes. So where were you trying to get these bioplastics to be used? Are we only talking about plastic bags, or were there other uses of this bioplastic? Well, it's, it's anywhere. It's in any product. So 
but it's not just the environmental impact. I mean, there's an there's a, a, a impact on the economy as well. These are uses that have to be innovative, they have to be imaginative, but they have to make sense. So if companies in Central Europe can come up with, have the information and the tools so they, they can come up with uses, they can become market leaders. I always to told companies that told me, oh, there's not enough demand. I told them, when these products will be on the shelf, it's too late. You must step in now. You must understand these materials. You know where to get them, how to process them. So we had a lot of pilot actions through which we were trying to illustrate facts about these materials. So it's, it's not just bags. It can be anywhere. People are trying to make telephones, housings for computers, uh, pens, and so on. I mean, they're, they're making everything out of it. And a lot of these applications are good, but some also have, they make no sense. And we're trying to clarify that. <laughs> so what would be your um, recommendation? Like, where would bioplastics be used ideally? Well, uh, bio-based plastics uh, make sense pretty much everywhere. If you're trying to uh, uh, reduce your environmental impact, that's... But, but still, when you do a, a environmental burden analysis, of course, you're shifting environmental burden, so your CO2, let's say, lower, but you might have a higher impact somewhere else. Uh, biodegradable plastics are, should be used wherever you, are, you have the possibility to throw the product out into bio, uh, so waste biotreatment, either composting or biogasification. So it doesn't make sense to make a pen that you will never throw in the compost, and you shouldn't because it has metal parts and all sorts of stuff. Uh, that's not a good use. But let's say for anything to do with uh, food or anything, you throw out very quickly, and it's possibly contaminated with bio stuff, that's perfect. All right, well, now let's talk about this other project, the BioCompact CE project. What was that all about? Yeah, it's another code name. Uh, it is. <laughs> this is uh, a project that's going on right now, and we've combined, actually, what we've learned in the Plastica uh, project, where communication was the main point, uh, and from another project where my uh, friends worked in, uh, Eco Paper Loop. They were working on paper over there and were on plastics. And we've put our heads together and said, okay, there are so many products out there where paper and plastic are combined. And I would just remind you, for example, of the bag that you probably use your, in your grocery store to buy bread. It has that nice little plastic window so you can see what you put in. Uh, when you put that into the waste, into the bin, where does it go? It goes in the paper or the plastic? And it certainly does not go in the bio-waste. It's a problem, and it is a problem, just like it is a problem for you. It's a problem for recycling of paper. It's a problem for recycling of plastics. And this can be solved. We have all the tools, all these materials exist. We just have to put them together in the right way so that we do not stop the waste uh, options part. And that's what we're trying to do. It's not just bags, but if you start thinking about it, there are many items that we use where we combine paper and plastics because they're really great materials and they go well together. They combine really well. So that's what we're working on. And I have a short video about that. Uh, I do. And there it is. Okay. Well, somebody's eating their lunch through the bag on the floor. His friend doesn't like it. And now can't decide where to put it. He has an idea. And he'll wave to you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> so
So the hope is that we will make uh, recycling more streamlined, more effective, and also uh, improve compliance for all of us who are confused about where to toss that bread uh, wrapping paper and then just end up throwing it into the regular trash, then maybe there'll be a better way uh, to discard our Well, we're talking about circular economy a lot. Yeah. And then we have such small obstacles that really just block everything. We need to get rid of them. And if we do that in Central Europe, I think we should be proud of it and we should go after it. Indeed, Mr. Tomasz Bondos, I would like to turn to you next. Um, and we're going to hear about uh, projects in your city, Bidgosh, and I understand. We have uh, first a little film to show everyone before we get to our conversation. So... Celem projektu REURIS było wypracowanie międzynarodowej współpracy z zasad postępowania w przypadku powrotu natury nad rzeki. Stare kanał bydgoski jest w zasadzie perełką na miarę Europy, ponieważ żadne inne miasto europejskie nie posiada czegoś takiego w centrum miasta i otoczonego plantami. W ramach tej inwestycji przywróciliśmy jeden z najbardziej zdegradowanych odcinków ludziom, którzy od tamtej pory mogą wypoczywać nad wodą w samym centrum Bydgoszczy. Szlak wody, przemysłu i rzemiosła to 15 obiektów, które tworzą spójną całość. Wszystkie też są w jakiś sposób powiązane z wodą. Woda wszechobecna w Bydgoszczy, będąca siłą napędową rozwoju miasta, kiedyś gwarantowała na przykład transport rzeczny, dzięki któremu miasto mogło się rozwijać. Budynek pasywny Centrum Demonstracyjne Odnawialnych Źródeł Energii w Bydgoszczy przy Zespole Szkół Mechanicznych nr 2 służy uczniom na kierunku technik urządzeń systemów energetyki odnawialnej do tego, żeby mogli uczyć się obsługi wszystkich urządzeń, jakie tutaj pracują. Jest to siłownia wiatrowa, moduły fotowoltaiczne, mamy instalacje kolektorów słonecznych, dwie pompy ciepła w układzie kaskadowym, które służą nam do ogrzewania pomieszczeń oraz instalację wentylacyjną z odzyskiem ciepła. Projekt Energy at School to międzynarodowa inicjatywa zrzeszająca 12 partnerów z 7 krajów Europy Środkowej. Partnerzy wspólnie dążyć będą do poprawienia edukacji w zakresie odnawialnych źródeł energii, tak aby mógł powstać nowy zawód strażnika energii budynku publicznego. Miasto Bydgoszcz jest jednym z 10 partnerów projektu City and Gov. Głównymi celami projektu jest harmonizacja danych energetycznych, utworzenie lub wzmocnienie jednostek zarządzania energią w mieście, jak również wypracowanie narzędzi do ograniczenia zmian klimatycznych w mieście. Do tej pory udało się stworzyć koncepcję bazy danych energetycznych, zakupić rowery elektryczne. W przyszłości planujemy również zakupić demonstracyjną kamerę termowizyjną, jak również ławki solarne. Projekt Cobra Man dotyczył zarządzania terenami poprzemysłowymi. Jego głównym celem było utworzenie stanowiska w, dla instytucji publicznych, menadżer do zarządzania terenami poprzemysłowymi. W Bydgoszczy zajęliśmy się zanieczyszczonym terenem, na którym teraz stoimy, który wcze, na którym wcześniej znajdowała się fabryka Papy. Zrekrutowaliśmy ten teren, zagospodarowaliśmy go na cele rekreacyjne i do tej pory jeszcze monitorujemy, co się dzieje pod ziemią. Kontynuacją projektu Cobra Man jest projekt Greener Sites. W Bydgoszczy upadły ogromne zakłady chemiczne. Teren po tych zakładach chemicznych jest przedmiotem działań pilotażowych w projekcie Greener Sites. Chcielibyśmy zbadać wpływ tego terenu zanieczyszczonego na tereny sąsiednie zamieszkałe Łęgnowa. Bardzo się cieszymy, że możemy uczyć się od innych partnerów w tym projekcie, którzy również borykają się z podobnymi problemami i mają w swoich miastach ogromne tereny poprzemysłowe. So a lot of different areas in which um, Interreg Europe has had an impact on cities such as yours. Um, with so many different um, areas uh, to address, so many different types of challenges, um, tell us from your perspective why it's important to have a wide range of partners from different regions, from different governance levels, and sort of areas of expertise to develop a city such as Bidgosh? 
Ladies and gentlemen, it's a honor for me that I can be here with you. Uh, I am on behalf of my president, Mr. Rafał Bruski. Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't be here. But uh, <coughs> I would like to tell you about my city. The uh, film has, I hope, answered partly, partly for these questions. And uh, yes, I can confirm that Interact program has changed my city and has changed the uh, view of my city and image of my city. I have to say that uh, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, in 2006, our president decided to join to Interact programs. He said, let's try, why not? We'll see what can we achieve. So for us, it was a solution uh, to check what Interact can offer for us and also what we can offer uh, for Interact and for the other partners. <clears throat> for us, the most important thing uh, that we are taking, taking part in those projects are people and are our citizens. Uh, we have realized and we have closed already four projects. Now we have opened four projects. To go, uh, total amount is eight projects. We are still looking for the other project uh, because Birgosh, my city, has changed for the last 10 years very, very, I think about 50% maybe. It is different uh, city when I was young. When I was young, people, I have in my city dirty water, dirty river, and uh, when we have joined to the Interact program, my mayor realized and people, directors and decision makers realized that we have to change something because people are moving out of the city. This is a problem in my country that most of big cities are decreasing when we are thinking about population. In West Europe is different situation. Mm, cities are bigger and bigger. I know that now about 70% of European population lives in cities. We have different problems. Our city now have to change something because we have to find solution. That's why we are in direct programs, how to make space of our city more attractive, more friendly for our citizens. All of us, we have to remember that interact program should help us change our cities because on the first stage in our city are citizens and people. That's we are in those programs and that's we are looking for cooperation and we are still trying to take so much so we can from the other partners and implement in our city. And of course we would like to, to offer our experiences to the other partners. Well, I have a question uh, perhaps for both of you. I know that um in some circles, Interreg may have the reputation of being somewhat complicated uh, compared to other funding instruments. And yet, um, your organization still, your city still decided uh, to participate in uh, Interreg transnational projects. Well, first of all, is it more complicated? And if it is, is it still worth it? Uh, it is a good question. Uh, it depends. Of course, you can find uh, any, the other solution uh, to find your, your ideas. For example, Horizon 2020, some Norwegian uh, mechanism of financing life program. But we made a decision to join to Interreg because I think that uh, total amount of money we have got is, is more than 3 million euro. But the money is not only the um, most important point of our cooperation with Intergec. Ideas and possibility to get knowledge from universities, from the other countries, from partners. It is the, I think it is more important than only 3 million euro. As you have seen on this short movie, of course we have invested those 3 million euros in our buildings to increase effect more efficient of, of public buildings and to run uh, some education programs. But, as I said, not only money are important, but knowledge and, mo and, and I, I would like to say that interact programs are very flexible. You can get so much so you can uh, involve your people and your personality in this program. If you are working hard in this program, you can reach goals you would like to reach. That's it. 
All right, and maybe just quickly from uh, your point of view, so Interreg, too complicated, okay complicated, and is it worth it? Well, when you come into Interreg, it is complicated, of course. But there's, after a while, you figure out there's a logic to it. And I think that in each of our languages, you know, we have the equivalent of the saying in English, no pain, no gain. There has to be a little bit of pain, and that means you're progressing probably. Sports people know that. Uh, and, you know, the administration, yes, because you're referring to that, may be difficult, but if somebody cannot account their expenses, they probably need to improve in that area because they're probably making mistakes, they're not efficient, and so on. They don't know where their money is going, their resources, and so on. So uh, also the idea of having you know, the, the difficult and very elaborate program makes sense. When you meet people who don't understand that and they start planning and... You just look at them and go, this is all upside down. You don't know what you're doing. And then you go like, oh, I learned this in Central Europe. Uh, so it does make sense. I think uh, you have to accept it and then forge ahead and focus on what you're trying to do. This is just one technical issue. Get help, find the information, just do it and go ahead because as we've seen in all these cases and all the uh, experiences, you can do so much. Do it. I think that's actually quite a good moment um, to leave it there. Uh, so we look to the future, look to see what can uh, become a little bit more efficient, but also take into account the complexity of the types of projects that uh, Interreg is trying to tackle. So you have a big challenge. You need a complex uh, project that... Uh, you know, it takes time and resources and a lot of effort, but ultimately I think everybody here uh, would agree it is definitely worthwhile. So thank you very much, um, Andre Kirjan, Tomas Bondos, and also to the rest of my panel members for all of your insights and thoughts and reflections about Interreg in your regions. Let's have a warm round of applause once again for my interview partners. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is your last chance to ask uh, anything of any one of our panel members or to just uh, give a quick comment, say, we love what you're doing, we're so happy that you're here. Anyone? Calling once, calling twice. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you again very, very much uh, for speaking with me, and uh, yeah, we'll... See you all.